Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In Egypt, the military dictatorship continues its rule. How did, in fact, this military regime come to power in Egypt? Now joining us to talk about the history of this regime is Gilbert Ashkar. He grew up in Lebanon. He's now a professor of development studies and international relations at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. His most recent book is The Arabs and the Holocaust, The Arab-Israeli War of Narratives. Thanks for joining us, Gilbert. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. So just to remind everybody again, here's a map of Egypt. Here's the Suez Canal, and you can see why it's so strategic. Uh, still, a great deal of oil and other goods goes through the Suez from the Middle East to Europe and products coming back the other way. And of course, Egypt is the most populous Arab country, strategically of great significance, also because of its current alliance with Israel. But how did all this come to pass? So we left off. Nasser is getting increasingly in confrontation with the United States. He started to nationalize sections of the economy. He's, uh, in order to uh, diminish his dependency on the United States, if I understand it correctly, started buying weapons from Czechoslovakia and got off the weapons system of the United States, which is a very big move of independence. Uh, so pick up the story from there, Gilbert. The Nasser regime was uh, dealt a very, very uh, decisive blow in 1967 by, by Israel. The tension in the Middle East over the Gulf of Aqaba blockade develops into full-scale war, with reports of heavy fighting between Israeli and Egyptian forces along the Gaza Strip and the Sinai border. Earlier, a mass rally in Cairo by Arab socialists shows support for UAR President Nasser. Israeli Chief of Staff General Yitzhak Rabin visits and inspects troops in the Negev Desert near the Egyptian border. Russia accuses America and Britain of encouraging Israel to attack. The 1967 war was launched by Israel for several reasons combined. We could say that on the one hand, of course, it wanted to occupy the rest of Palestine, uh, that is the, the West Bank uh, and Gaza, which weren't occupied by the Zionist movement in 1948 and left until the next opportunity, which was 67. And also it wanted to deal a heavy blow leading to possible overthrow of uh, the two most radical regimes in the Arab world in the environment of Israel, which were Egypt on the one hand and Syria. Uh, at that time, uh, on the other hand. In that respect, of course, this, is, this was a very important war for the United States because in so doing, uh, Israel was also doing a big service to the United States in trying to put down the two main challengers of the United States uh, in the region. Just for in fairness sake, the Israeli narrative of this is that they thought Egypt might attack and they decided to knock out the Egyptian Air Force before there could be an attack and they knocked out the Air Force in three days. I mean, I mean, just quickly, do you have any sense of the, of the truth of the, either narrative here, or are they both, tr are they both true? They, I mean, in, in the Israeli uh, uh, perception of thing, it, it, it can be uh, explained as a preemptive strike, but they had a lot of information, and the United States definitely had information about the fact that Egypt was not really serious on attacking Israel. There wasn't any real uh, imminent threat. They knew about that, but in any case, I mean, the two countries were in a state of confrontation. If Israel needed to seize the West Bank and Gaza, it would have anyhow gone into a war with the two countries. So better for Israel to take the initiative, as they did, destroy the Egyptian aviation before it can even take off and, uh, and achieve the, the, the tremendous victory they achieved in uh, June 67. The Six-Day Middle East War echoes along a second front, the diplomatic struggle at the United Nations Security Council. Syrian Ambassador George Tome charges Israel with continued ceasefire violations, saying that Israeli tank forces advanced toward a branch of the Jordan River to establish control of a strategically important water resource. He calls it systematic invasion. Israeli Ambassador Gideon Raphael answers the truce violation charges. Israeli government officers announce their victory wipes out previous armistice agreements and frontiers. And that victory is a swift, smashing, and total one. 
as crack Air Force, infantry, artillery, and tank corps combine to sweep across the Sinai Peninsula to the Suez Canal, east into Jordan, north into Syria. So what happens next? Well, what happens next is that, uh, and that's a huge, again, difference between what we, now, what we have now and, and that time. You know, uh, as a result of the war, Nasser proclaimed on television a very dramatic speech, his resignation from uh, his post as head of state. And so <laughs> you can already see a very big difference. And the result of that was absolutely a huge demonstration in Cairo and all over Egypt asking him to, to stay in power. <laughs> that, the completely reverse situation. But it's a testimony to the real popularity of Nasser, who and undoubtedly has been one of the most popular leaders of the, the, the Third World, one of the most popular leaders of what used to be called, or is still called, the non-aligned movement, which was born in the mid-50s. This alliance of African, Asian, and, uh, and Latin American countries, at that time, these countries had mostly in common some, some degree of anti-imperialist uh, stance. And so Nasser also has, was extremely popular uh, for Egypt because despite the dictatorship, despite the military dictatorship, in terms of social transformation of the country, there were real gains for the Egyptian masses. Huge numbers of peasants uh, were empowered by, by becoming uh, landowners. The conditions of the workers in the state industries were relatively advanced compared to, at least to the environment that you had in the Arab world. There were definitely advanced in terms of, of rights, of uh, social rights. I'm not speaking of political rights, of course. And uh, education, democratization of the education was very deep. Uh, and so you have a, a lot of, uh, of social changes that were brought in by, by the regime, which compensated, if you want, in the, in the people's mind, the problem of its being a military dictatorship, a regime ruled by, by the army and by its uh, mukhabarat. So this explains why there's still, at least partly explains why there's such respect for the army and people don't necessarily see it as an antagonist, at least in terms of the mythology around the army. So what, what happens to Nasser? He stayed in power for three more years until he died in 1970. And when he died, his successor was uh, Anwar al-Sadat, who was one of the most right-wing members of the military clique in power. And Sadat very quickly embarked on a program of denasserization of Egypt, which basically was a kind of forerunner of what will be called later on structural adjustment programs. Does the United States have any hand in the rise of Sadat? No, not in the rise of Sadat, but Sadat uh, quickly shifted Egypt from uh, the uh, alliance with the Soviet Union uh, into an alliance with the United States. So the, the Egypt uh, moved from, from one camp to another in a quite radical manner. In 1972, Sadat expelled the Soviet experts from Egypt. All those Soviet experts were there as advisors and trainers. Uh, for the Egyptian army, uh, mostly. They were expelled from Egypt. Uh, he uh, invited uh, uh, Nixon to, to Egypt, and uh, gradually the, the country turned into a key ally of, of the United States uh, in the region. People are not always aware of the fact that uh, for uh, the Nixon-Kissinger kind of team that you had in the United States, uh, you had a kind of uh, exchange, uh, in a sense, at the global level between uh, Vietnam that they lost, but they, they, they moved out of Vietnam in 1973. And one of the things that facilitated that for them is that they achieved a major gain in a much more strategic area than Southeast Asia, which is the Middle East. And this uh, strategic gain that they achieved was winning uh, Egypt over. That was absolutely huge for the United States. And that also explains why Egypt has become, uh, is, still is, and has been like that for many years, the second recipient of U.S. foreign aid after Israel. Of course, Israel is, is the first, but uh, Egypt is number two. And uh, the bulk of this so-called aid that the United States gives to, to Egypt is actually military aid. That is, the United States is uh, one of the key funders of the Egyptian military. So this military has completely changed its nature. Uh, this is no longer the, the kind of, uh, of army that uh, was represented by Nasser or uh, had as a kind of symbolic uh, figure Nasser. This is a different army. And despite the, the fact that Sadat in particular 
uh, led Egypt into the 1973 war against Israel, which is uh, one where, where Egypt this time had the initiative and which was presented as a great uh, triumph and victory of, of Egypt. And that was a completely false presentation of things because the, the, the truth is that it ended with Egypt on the verge of a military disaster and the, the Israeli having crossed the canal in the other direction. But leave that aside, despite all that and the glory that Sadat wanted to give himself, Actually, his social policies of denationalization, of reprivatization, of opening the Arabic term is the infitah, but opening for private capital, opening the public sector, and all that led to such uh, terrible social results of inflation, of unemployment, or uh, all kind of, uh, of problems that he quickly became very much unpopular. And you had a major social revolt in 1977 caused by the rising prices of bread and other basic commodities and uh, Sadat ended up being assassinated in 1981. Cairo today. The assassination of Anwar el-Sadat. Tonight, a full report. And when you compare uh, the kind of funerals that he had with those of Nasser, you, you get the difference between the two. Nasser's funeral was, again, an absolutely huge outpouring of popular sentiments, of popular grief, and a huge, huge, huge mass demonstrations. Whereas Sadat's uh, funeral was done in a quite cold atmosphere. This man was not popular at all, and you can say the same of the regime in general. By Sadat's death, the Egyptian army and the Egyptian state has more or less become a client state of the United States. It has become a client state of the United States, and uh, the, even the, the character of the army, although, of course, the army was corrupt, bureaucratic, whatever we want to say, even under Nasser, but its nature also changed uh, through the switch of allegiance. At the same time that there was a, a reduction of the space for state capitalism, for the public sector in the country, and an increasing space for uh, the private sector and all sorts also of corruption and greed, the army itself also turned into some kind of trust with capitalistic interest. It, it has, it owns, it's a huge institution, it owns uh, industries and economic sectors, and the officer caste of the Egyptian army today is uh, much uh, further, much more cut from uh, the, the social roots and, uh, and the people than, uh, than they, what they used to be uh, in, the, in the 50s and, and 60s. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we'll begin the Mubarak era. Please join us for the next segment of our interview on The Real News Network.